This chapter will outline all of the various tools used in the lab, uh, as well as methods to identify microbes. Unfortunately, being in the lab is not something we will have the opportunity to do this summer. So these are the five major eyes that we will be focusing on. Inoculation involves taking various samples or microbes and placing them on various types of media. Incubation involves placing our inoculated samples in specific conditions. Isolation is a process used to obtain one particular microbe from a mixed sample. Inspection utilizes microscopes as well as visual examination. And finally, identification uses various techniques to identify an organism to their species level. Inoculation involves culturing or growing microbes in different types of media. The medium typically contains a wide variety of ingredients, if you will. The lab worker or you as students would take a small amount of the microorganism and place it on the medium. In the clinical setting, the samples can come from virtually anywhere. After a sample has been inoculated on the medium, it is placed in an incubator at a set temperature. Now, not all microorganisms grow at the same temperatures, so the temps on the incubator can be changed. Typically, those organisms used in the lab grow in the range of 20 to 45 degrees Celsius, which is about body temperature, or at least 37 degrees Celsius is. Concentration of gases can also be changed to suit a particular organism. These set conditions allow for growth of the bacteria or other microbes, which, which can then be visualized on the medium. In these particular images, we can see different types of cultures. The first one shows us a pure culture, which means there's only one type of bacteria in each of these tubes. You'll notice that the bacteria can grow in various pigments. In the second image, on the plate, we can see a mixed culture in which there are two different microbes depicted by the white and yellow colonies. The third image shows us what a contaminated culture looks like. Ideally, if a sample was taken from the tube, all we should see growing on the plate are red colonies, but you'll notice the white growth. This could have come from contaminants in the air, or the plate could have been left open while the student was talking during inoculation. The different types of media used in the laboratory can be stored in tubes, as you've just seen, along with flask and petri dishes. We discussed inoculation, but how is this accomplished? Cultures can be obtained using loops and needles, which are frequently used in the laboratory. Pipettes and swabs can also be utilized as well. It's very imperative that proper sterile techniques are used to prevent contamination. We can see media in different states as well. Some are liquid, which is called a broth. We have some that are semi-solids, often called deeps. And we also have solids in two different forms. They can be used to identi identify specific properties of a bacterium. Agar is a major ingredient of media. It is a carbohydrate, which has the ability to solidify. It's a great ingredient because a lot of microbes can't digest it, so it won't be broken down. Here you can see the three major states of media. The first shows the liquid form, the second showing the semi-solid form, which can be used to determine if an organism is motile or if it can produce a certain substance, like hydrogen sulfide depicted with the black color. The last image shows a solid that can be reverted to a liquid. All media is different, and they can be classified based on their ingredients. If a medium is defined or synthetic, then we know the exact components of every single ingredient. A complex medium 
may have one or two ingredients in which the composition of them is not known. A lot of times they contain extra specific special ingredients like blood, milk, or yeast. Here's an example of a defined medium. We can see that the exact amount of amino acids is known, as well as down to the moles of additional ingredients. Our complex medium is not as precise. Here we can't see the exact composition of each of the ingredients. As I mentioned before, microbes have set temperature requirements along with gas requirements. So it shouldn't be a surprise that they also have specific media that they prefer. On a general purpose media, a wide variety of organisms can be grown. Typically, it's a complex medium. An enriched medium has specific extra ingredients like blood or growth factors to allow for the growth of fastidious microbes, which are the picky eaters of the microbes. Usually, this type of medium is used in labs to grow organisms from samples that may not have a significant amount of microbes. In this particular image, we can see a couple of examples of enriched media. The left one is a blood auger, which can be used to grow organisms like Streptococcus. The right medium is chocolate auger, which can be utilized to grow Neisseria species. We even get more specific with selective media. These guys have at least one ingredient that prevents the growth of a particular microbe. This medium can be used to isolate a pure culture from a sample that may contain multiple types of species. This limits the type of organisms we will see grow. Differential media has ingredients that allows for us to visually see differences in bacteria on the medium. Usually it's color differences that we see. Those color differences may be in the colonies themselves or the actual media. In some cases, we may see gas bubbles, which indicates the bacterium produce gas via the breakdown of a particular ingredient in the medium. Here we can see the differences in a selective medium and a differential medium. On both sides, inoculums are taken from a mixed sample. On the left, we can see that all microbes grow on a general purpose medium, while only specific ones grow on the selective medium. On our right side, we can see all organisms grow, but they all look very similar. But if we look at our differential medium, we now have the ability to see differences in colors of the colonies as well as the medium. Both the selective and differential media allows for identification of organisms in a sample from perhaps a patient. Typically what we use in the laboratory is both selective and differential media. McConkie auger is a type that is both. It has ingredients in it that prevents the growth of gram-positive organisms and allows for the growth of gram-negative ones. There are dyes in it that allow for differentiation of the gram-negative organisms based on metabolic properties. Reducing medium can be utilized to grow anaerobic bacteria, or those that do not like being in the presence of oxygen. There is also transport media that can be used in instances in which samples must be kept for extended periods of time. There's also specific media that has various sugars that an organism can break down. They also have pH indicators that change color if fermentation occurs. You can see the control with nothing inoculated in it is a red color. The second tube has a slight fuchsia color indicating an alkaline environment. The last two tubes are yellow, which shows fermentation occurred and that acids are produced. Gas bubbles can also be seen in glass germ tubes. 
assay media can be used to determine how well a particular antibiotic works against a microbe. They can also be used to test items like Clorox, Lysol, and mouthwash on microbes. Enumeration media is utilized to determine the concentration of microbes in food, milk, and water to make sure that the numbers are safe for human consumption. Isolation is used to obtain a pure colony, which is simply a tiny mound of cells on the medium. In order to obtain a pure culture, a medium as well as an inoculating loop is required. The idea of the technique is to take an inoculum from a mixed sample and separate the individual colonies. There are various methods used to isolate bacteria. The one most frequently used in the teaching labs is the streak plate method. An inoculum is taken from a sample and the first streak is made. The loop is then heated and another streak is made. This is repeated until four streaks are made. The purpose is to decrease the concentration by the time it reaches the fourth streak. The pour plate method and spread plate methods are also utilized. After inoculation and incubation, you can now begin the identification process. This can be achieved by the use of a microscope, metabolic properties such as fermentation. Special media can also be used to identify specific nutrient requirements, whether a microbe produces a particular enzyme or how their energy is acquired. Further genetic and immunologic testing can also be done to identify a microbe to the species level. Those organisms that we can see with a naked eye are usually in the size range of centimeters and meters, while microscopic organisms like bacteria are in the range of millimeters, micrometers, and nanometers. Here we can see the sizes of various microbes, our smallest being viruses, which are in the nanometer size range. Bacteria, typically are in the micrometer range along with yeast. Protozoa are a bit larger. This image gives references to nanometers, micrometers, and nanometers. Excuse me, and millimeters. We will also discuss different types of microscopes. The basic microscope used in the lab is a compound light microscope. The ocular has a magnification of 10x and is what you look into to visualize the specimen. The nose piece contains the various objective lenses which further magnify the specimen. The stage is where your specimen sits and can be moved using the stage knobs. The course adjustment knob takes the specimen closer and further away from the objective lens. The fine focus knob brings the image into focus at your higher magnifications. The diaphragm control has the ability to control the amount of light that passes through the specimen. Let's discuss magnification. The objective lenses provide the real image, whereas the virtual image comes from the ocular. We can calculate total magnification by multiplying the magnification of the ocular, which is always 10x, by the magnification of the objective lens being used. If you're using the 40x objective lens, the total magnification would be 400x. Resolution, also known as resolving power, is the ability to distinguish two separate entities from each other. We have a resolution of 0.2 micrometer, millimeters, 
Meaning that in order for our eyes to see two separate objects as being separate, they must not be closer than 0.2 millimeters to one another. Microscope has a much better resolution. In this image, we can see how increased resolution gives us the ability to see finer details. To visualize bacteria, we must use our oil immersion lens, which is our 100x lens. Not only do we require this lens, but we also require oil, which helps to bend the light rays on the specimen. Without oil, the rays scatter and the image would be distorted. Refractive index is the physics of the light rays bending between different mediums such as water or air. The more that the light rays bend, the sharper the image. We do have the ability to control the light with the iris diaphragm. Let's discuss microscopy. We will start with bright field, which is what we utilize most frequently in the lab. With this type, the light passes through the specimen, which gives a lighter background. This type of microscopy can be used for live organisms as well as prepared slides. Dark field microscopy prevents light from passing through the objective lens and bounces off the specimen. This gives us a dark background with an illuminated specimen. This is great to visualize live cells that can't be stained or may be sensitive to an excess amount of light. Phase contrast microscopes allow for us to visualize structures and organisms based on differences in density. It's very useful to identify particular structures like endospores or cilia. Fluorescence microscopy uses dyes that emit light after being hit with UV rays. Depending on the dyes used, it may be a red, blue, or green color that is seen. This can be used to diagnose cancer as well as to determine if treatment is effective. Confocal microscopes give us the ability to see structures even if they are thick. Usually the specimens are stained with fluorescent dyes. This is also useful in the clinical setting. Our next two types of microscopes use electrons rather than a basic light source. The transmission electron microscope allows us to see fine details in specimens as well as viruses. These samples require very precise preparation and must be cut in very thin slices. Just to put it in perspective, a piece of tissue paper is very thin. The specimens must be cut 25 times thinner than that. This gives us a great 2D image. Scanning electron microscopes give us a 3D image. Most images that you see in textbooks come from this type of microscope. We talked about how to visualize them, but how are the slides prepared? It all depends on what we are trying to observe. Is it alive or dead? What are we trying to look at? And what types of microscopes do we have available? Live organisms are prepared using wet mounts or hanging drop mounts. In a wet mount, a drop of the culture is placed on a slide and a cover slip is placed on it. In a hanging drop method, the sample is placed in a well and a sealant is used to place the cover slip over the culture and the sample is suspended. If we didn't stain our cells, 
we would have a very difficult time visualizing them in the microscope. In the staining procedure, different dyes are used. Basic dyes have a positive charge, while acidic dyes have or negative. Bacteria have phosphate groups in the cell membrane, so are negatively charged. This charge attracts basic dyes, and it takes on the color of that dye. They do the opposite with acidic dyes. They repel those, and the background is instead stained. Positive stains adhere to the bacterium and it will pick up that color. A negative stain is repelled and the organism is bright and the background is dark. In this particular stain, you don't heat fix the specimen because the cells will be reduced. Simple stains are just that and only one dye is used. This gives us the ability to see the shape of the organism the relative size, and how it's arranged. It just gives us a generalized idea of what the bacterium looks like. A differential stain uses two different dyes. It gives us the ability to determine differences in cells or structures. Here is a simple stain of both a bacterium and a yeast. You can see the shape and general size. One of the most common differential stains is the Gram stain, which gives us the ability to distinguish differences in cells based on the cell wall. Two dyes, crystal violet and safranin, are used along with Gram's iodine and alcohol. The Gram stain shows differences in cell walls based on how they react to the reagents. This is the key tool used in the identification process. It's also important for diagnostic purposes, as well as what antibiotic needs to be prescribed. An acid fast stain shows differences in acid fast bacteria, which stain pink, from non-acid fast bacteria, which stain blue. This is the most useful tool to identify mycobacterium tuberculosis. This bacterium has a waxy cell wall that most dyes can't penetrate. Carbol fusion, methylene blue, and acid alcohol are used in this stain along with heat. An endospore stain uses heat to force dyes into the specimen. It shows differences between endospores and vegetative cells. This stain is vital in identifying organisms like Bacillus anthracis and Clostridium botulinum, the causative agent of botulism. Here are the various differential stains. Gram stain shows us purple gram positive bacterium or bacteria and pink gram negative bacteria. Again, these differences are due to cell wall differences. Acid fast positive organisms are pink and the blue cells being acid fast negative cells. This is useful to identify mycobacterium. The last one shows us endospores, which are green, and the vegetative cells, which are pink. This stain important in identifying clostridium and bacillus. We also have special stains in addition to the differential stains. Some organisms produce a carbohydrate rich substance called a capsule, which can be detected by a capsule stain using India ink. Flagellar staining can be used to determine if an organism has flagella, which allows for movement. On the left, we can see a dark background and a brightly illuminated capsule surrounding the bacterium. We can also see on our right many flagella.